for this afternoon session um, on students and students <coughs> at the of the university. That's supposed to be a question, but when I put it as a question, it didn't quite. Um, that didn't matter. Um, so it's not a statement. We are here to in interrogate um, whether or not students really are, see themselves or really are consumers. My name is Shirley Laws and I'll be your chair and I'll be introducing our, our very distinguished and, and interesting panel in just a second. Um, but I think there are some issues that really we, well, we hope we're going to, and I hope that you're going to have uh, lots to say about, about whether in fact students really do see themselves as consumers. I mean, is that the, absolutely the case? And if they do, is it partially justified? Uh, aren't they entitled these days to a higher education that is going to make them employable? There's a question. Is it still possible, really, to talk about higher education, the university education, as offering um, a pro uh, offering study about the, and to talk about knowledge for its own sake? Is that still something that we should be aspiring to? <coughs> And I think there's an issue as well about well where has all the where has all um, the, the the consumer um, conversation, if you like, come from? Is it because of government policy? But where the lecturers stand in all this, and, and is their authority being undermined, or are they actually complicit in the erosion of what the university education should and could mean? Well, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, in the order that they're going to speak. And first of all, on my far left is um, Professor Michael Young. And uh, Michael has had a very distinguished career in education, in higher education, um, and is in, in very well known internationally as um, in the field of sociology of education. <coughs> he began his career, though, um, as many of us did, as a secondary school teacher, and in his case, a secondary school teacher of science. Um, and he now teaches, um, he's an emeritus professor um, at the Institute of Education, where he teaches on the MA program of education for professors, sorry, professions, and um, he supervises research students. He's also a visiting professor at a number of in other universities all over the world. Um, published enormously throughout his career, and most recently um, he's preparing a book now on, the, on knowledge and professions, but I think probably the, um, the one that more recently he's very well known for is called Bringing Knowledge Back In. So that's Michael. Can we just welcome Michael to the panel? Um, second to speak on my left is Joanna Williams, and Joanna um, Dr. Joanna Williams is a lecturer in higher education and academic practice at the University of Kent. Um, her research focuses on the impact of changing political objectives on, it, um, uh, political objectives on education. Um, she also has a book coming out very soon, and her book is called <coughs> Consuming Higher Education Why Learning Can't Be Bought, which tells you a little bit possibly about the sort of things that. Uh, Joanna might be saying, and that's coming up very shortly. Uh, she lives in Canterbury, she says, and she spends far too much time worrying about the education of her three children. Um, there's probably a few people around the room who might also feel that way. Um, okay, third speak will be Aaron Porter, who's just on my left here. And Aaron um, is a consultant and a journalist, although he was previously president of the NUS and chair of the, uh, uh, the trustees of the NUS during what was clearly a very high profile um, issue when, uh, when the tuition fees debate first came out in 2010-2011. He's also made several appearances, lots of appearances on TV, um, Question Time, Newsnight, Politics Show, and has published articles in the Times, Guardian, New Statesman, the list goes on. Um, he started out in this, in this, um, in the academic, in his academic career at least, um, <coughs> as a student of English literature at the University of Leicester. Uh, at New University of Leicester. So welcome to you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to okay. 
and finally, our, our fourth person to be speaking on the panel is, is, um, is Donna sorry, I'm lost, uh, Sabri, who is a research fellow at, a visiting research fellow for the Centre Cent for Pub uh, Public Policy at King's College London. Um, and where she is also, an and she also does uh, works as an independent researcher, but her research interests are in the sociology of higher education, pedagogy, institutional and international policy relating to higher education and the use of social theory in empirical research. Um, she's currently leading a longitudinal study of students' identity, curriculum and experience of HU. So welcome to Donna. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley, and thank you, and uh, delighted to be here. I've been trying to get the better ideas for the last three years, and I've last made it. Um, students as consumers at the heart of the university. I think we also we need to remember, first of all, that in fact there are quite a number of countries in the world, including that little country north of the border, which don't have these at all. And once you, and if you don't have these, the issue of, of students as consumers doesn't really arise. You can go right the way through. Uh, University, you get your doctorate and in uh, Finland, and you get it's free all the way right to the doctorate. We need to remember that some countries actually still hold on to that vision. Um, my own view is that, in fact, uh, the idea of uh, having a policy, and it comes from the Lord Brown report, it was uh, <coughs> launched by the Labour Party, it then became part of the current government's uh, higher education policy, uh, had two possibilities. One is untenable because no government is actually going to allow consumers to really have a, the major role of what happens in universities because they have a lot of other interests. Um, and so it will end up in some kind of confusion. And if it didn't, it would actually destroy the universities as we know it, except perhaps for a kind of tiny elite in our version of something like the American Ivy League. So I want to make, really, I want to give you four of my reasons why I think such an approach to higher education and universities that we must oppose it. The first one is political, the kind of society it leads to. The second one is about inequalities and the inequalities it will generate. The third one is pedagogic, about the implications for the relationship between teachers and students in universities. And the fourth one, use that horrible word, epistemological, but basically it's raising the question about will a consumer-led university ever actually be a place where new knowledge is created? So those are my, so if uh, I get stopped by Shirley before, uh, at least you know what I was going to try and say. Um, and uh, let, let me start with the, quickly, with the political one. I've got two big points to make, it seems to me. Uh, if higher education becomes a consumption good, rather than the public good, we lose two very important values that are part of any democracy. One is the autonomy from individual choice or markets that higher education actually needs. Because if your universities are going to be, as somebody once said, the critic and conscious of society, you can't have them tied in the individual choices of any group of students or any other. They actually have to have that autonomy to play that role. And, any, and if you think of any societies which don't have them having that role, you wouldn't like to live in them, and nor would I. Um, the second is that, in fact, uh, the, if you put consumers, students as consumers at the heart of the university, it is actually a denial of a key important role of public goods in the society. What are the ones that have gone as public goods than our private goods? Railways, telephones, fuel, banks, prison, increasing the health and social services. All, in a sense, were public goods and now are subject to the market. And it seems to me that if universities go down that route, then so will BBC and will only be left with the market. Now, does that matter? I think it does, because, in a sense, it gradually removes all the areas in public life that, in fact, it matters what we vote about. In other words, it diminishes democracy and it diminishes us as citizens in a democracy, because, in a sense, we end up by being consumers. The world is a test case. Uh, second point, then, is the social justice argument. If you put the consumer students at as consumers at the heart of the university, it is not really about free choice. It is as best, at best, it's about choice for those who have the cultural and economic resources to make the choices. And there are very few choices, if you 
been to a bad school, and there are very few classes if you get three Ds at A level. So it's in a sense, a, it, it's a delusion that that should be. What about the pedagogic grounds? I think it's very important to say that learning, which is in fact what universities are primarily concerned about, <coughs> learning is not consumption. Because if you consume something, it has to be replaced. When knowledge is acquired by students, the knowledge remains for the new students. The very different kind of thing that's important to hold on to that. Um, learning is not a relationship between buyers and sellers. It's a pedagogic relationship between students, uh, between students and teachers. Uh, and and if, if the more it becomes a buying and selling relationship, uh, the more it distorts the relationships of pedagogy. What do we mean by a relationship of pedagogy? Relationship of pedagogy is like any other professional relationship. It's a relationship based on trust. It's a relationship based on authority. This is not an arbitrary authority. It's an authority based on the student trusting that the teacher has greater knowledge which in fact the student wants. So it is inescapably hierarchical, like any other relationship between a profession and her client, a member of a profession and her client. That doesn't mean that students don't need to have guarantees that in fact that authority, as it can be, is sometimes abused. That is another, is another but equally important issue. Being a student, in my view, has nothing to do with consumption and only initially to do with choice. It involves dialogue between the student's trust in the specialist knowledge of the teacher. Last one, the epistemological grounds. What I'm really raising here is the question about universities, because they, they have two roles in a sense. They're producing, they, they are educating students, and the second role is that they are our major institution for creating new knowledge. Um, now, if we make students as consumers rather than students as students <coughs> at the heart of university, um, then in fact their goal of developing their knowledge as far as they can, of actually learning what it is to, be, to try and find out the truth about something in a particular field, that, I can't, that will in fact collapse. Uh, student, universities will be driven, I think, to in fact give students what they think they want when they come to university. Uh, and that leads us to ask the question, to my mind, is where will then the new researchers coming from, from that experience, who are in a sense asking the, asking the questions about the knowledge they're getting, where will that come from? If they've seen themselves as only in fact buying and selling and getting some, some, some consumption good. Um, and the other thing is that in fact, if that happens, what other institutions are there going to be in the society that we're in, that in fact they've still got a license for staff and students to actually uh, debate, think, and what one sociologist one thought referred to as thinking the unthinkable and the not yet thought. Where is that going to go on? If it doesn't go on, we're a static and in a sense a dying society. So just finally, I think then there is an important debate about students and about university and higher education. It's about their purposes and it's about its uh, it, the purposes of the university and it's about pedagogy. Uh, and it involves those of us in the university thinking very seriously about how we actually support students to actually be able to take the risks about thinking the unthinkable and, in fact, what's next, what has not been thought. Because that's what they will need to have done if they're going to have the kind of role in the future society that we know they will. Okay. Thank you very much. consumers at the university has been a uh, common currency in some of the newspapers since about 1998 and sometimes it's used positively to suggest that students are now empowered to hold universities to account and more often recently it's used pejoratively to describe a sense of entitlement that students may have to um, passively obtain a degree commodity irrespective of any intellectual effort that they may have put into the process. Um, Describing students in this way, though, as, as consumers, I think, mixes up a couple of things. It, it alludes to some real problems that are there in our universities at the moment, but it also mixes up a, a political distaste for capitalism, markets, and consumerism. And I think one danger of the debate is that it can result in blaming students themselves for <coughs> behaving and acting like consumers. Um, I want to make five points 
and the first point on Craig Michael, I'm sorry, is to disagree with something that he said. Um, I think it's really important at the beginning of this debate to actually separate out consumer status from the payment of tuition fees. Um, tuition fees, I would argue, are as much a symptom of students being perceived as consumers as they are a direct cause. So just an example to illustrate this point, students were described as consumers or customers of a university before 1998 when tuition fees were first charged. Uh, in 1993, uh, the then Conservative government published a student charter which contained a formal statement that students were customers of a university and that the purpose of the university was to serve these customers. And obviously, I mean, it goes without saying that, that students are not involved in a direct tran uh, financial transaction. Um, I wish students handed over £10 notes as they entered a lecture theatre, but unfortunately it's not the case, not in my lectures anyway. Um, and, and even the nature of the financial transaction that students make with their institutions is fairly tenuous. Often students just receive a letter um, informing them that a bill has been paid on their behalf by the student loans company. So what exactly is meant by this label then, the student as consumer? I would argue it's often used just simply as a convenient shorthand to describe an attitude or a way of thinking or a way of behaving. And it's an attitude that students can adopt whether or not they pay tuition. <coughs> I would argue that these attitudes are just as prevalent in Scotland as they are in England. Um, I think above all it's about uh, describing students as consumers alludes to this sense of entitlement um, an assumption that a degree is a product like any other commodity and it's an entitlement irrespective of effort or intellectual engagement. So that's the first point I want to make. Students have not become consumers solely as a result of paying tuition fees. Um, I think it's important to ask, I mean, thinking about that, if tuition fees stopped tomorrow, um, would students stop behaving and acting as if they had an entitlement to receive a degree? And I would argue, no. The second point I want to make is that students are not solely to blame for thinking and acting as consumers. Uh, government policy, successive governments, have um, actively encouraged students to think of themselves as consumers. Um, most recently, we've had the Brown Review into Higher Education, which suggests students have a role to play. Students themselves have a role to play in driving up standards in HE through bringing into existence a university marketplace. Uh, the logic is, for those who are not aware of this, that uh, the money now follows individuals, and so the universities which are able to attract the uh, most fee payers will have the most financial success in years to come. But for reading government policy, it can appear almost as if students have a moral responsibility to behave like consumers, to compare the market, to shop around, and to provide feedback on the service that they receive. Uh, but again, I would argue that it's not the existence of an, of an HE marketplace alone that turns students into consumers. I think a marketplace in HE could exist without students acting, thinking, behaving as consumers. Um, I think something more insidious that emerges from government policy is the instrumental sense that a degree is to be seen as an investment product, um, an investment in yourself from which you can expect to receive a guaranteed financial return in years to come. Uh, back in 1997, Deering, in his review of higher education, urged governments and universities to, and I quote, encourage the student to see him or herself as an investor in receipt of a service and to seek as an investor value for money and a good return from the investment. And obviously if back in 1997 Deering was urging governments, uh, urging governments and universities to make sure that this happened, it suggested that students at that time were not seeing themselves in this way to begin with. Um, today, uh, government-sponsored websites tell potential university applicants, and again I quote, a higher education qualification can lead to increased earning potential, a wider range of opportunities, and a more rewarding career. Uh, and again, it kind of reiterates the most important point. On average, graduates tend to earn substantially more than people with A-levels who did not go to university. Projected over a working lifetime, the difference is something like £100,000 before tax at today's valuation. So before arriving at university, students, youngsters, receive a very powerful message. They are told that the next three years is not to be spent immersed in your favourite subject, 
confronting intellectual challenge or finding out more about the world. Instead, it's about getting your £100,000 before tax, earning slightly more and having greater job security, which to my mind is not massively inspiring. However, I also think, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, I think it's not just a question of national government policy being to blame for students acting as consumers. I think institutions and academics have something to answer for too. I think universities actively encourage students to see themselves as consumers. And one thing I want to focus on is the current preoccupation with employability as an example of how a trend in education other than the payment of tuition fees encourages students to see themselves as consumers. <coughs> The third point I want to make then is that the, it's the inability of universities and academics to defend knowledge as an end in itself that has opened up higher education to a range of more instrumental purposes. Again, something I'm afraid I disagree with Michael on. I think seeing higher education as a public good is also problematic. I think seeing higher education as a public good began at the turn of the 20th century and that was to promote a view that higher education could play a role in relation to the national economy. And there would be spillovers and externalities from this which would benefit everyone in society. But essentially what that was about was about saying that education knowledge <coughs> was not necessarily important for its own sake, but that knowledge had to serve an instrumental purpose, albeit one which is slightly more palatable perhaps than the view of um, the instrumental purpose that higher education serves today. So over the past 20 years, what's happened is that we've had a shift from higher education serving an instrumental public good to an instrumental private good. So higher education today is not about uh, the public economy, but your own private economy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that it's about investment in your own private stock of human capital for you to secure that £100,000. And this belief that higher education is to serve an instrumental purpose outside of knowledge as an end in itself has become all-encompassing. And what it means in terms of what goes on in the classroom is that there can be a focus upon the form that education takes rather than the content of education. So the aim becomes not so much discussing the Shakespeare play because the Shakespeare play is interesting, but that by participating in a discussion, you're honing your communication skills, for example. And what this means is that the focus on knowledge is lost. The fourth point I want to make, I'm trying to speed up, is that because of this instrumental focus on education, because knowledge <coughs> has been lost, uh, it means that both those arguing for and against tuition fees argue uh, have, have much in common. Um, so the, the, if the instrumental purpose means that if education is all about employability, then if you think that human capital is important, uh, then you think <coughs> that paying tuition fees is fair enough because it's an investment in yourself. If you think that social justice or social equity are important, then you may also go along with the idea that education is about employability because it's the employability which will enable you to become socially mobile. And so the disagreement is about who should pay. The disagreement isn't about what higher education is for. Okay, I'll um, move very, very quickly on then. The fifth and final point I want to make is that putting students at the heart of the system, and this is where I do agree with Michael, putting students at the heart of the system just serves to further displace knowledge to the detriment of higher education and students themselves. It's engaging with the knowledge content of education that makes people question everything they thought they knew about themselves and the world they live in. And it's this that can be potentially transformative, not learning how to write a report or give a, give a presentation. Uh, if we don't encourage students to focus on knowledge, the danger is they can remain permanently adolescent permanently focused upon themselves and their own immediate preoccupations. Uh, but putting, putting knowledge at the heart of the system will really encourage students to move beyond themselves and their own preoccupation <coughs> with them, themselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Shirley. Uh, I'm sorry, Joanna. Um, uh, let me uh, just begin by saying I think the 
the way in which the, the debate around students as consumers has sometimes been narrowly focused as to whether they are uh, consumers or whether they're co-producers co of, their, of their higher education is far too narrow. I think it's the, it's the shades of grey that will be important in, in this debate. And so I, I want to uh, finish off by uh, uh, talking about the extent to which I think that students unquestionably have uh, consumer traits, how I think some of those are actually to the, to the benefit of the students themselves and indeed of their higher education experience. However, I also want to separate out where being a consumer of their higher education is also to their individual detriment and also to the detriment of higher education. I want to take a, and I will take a view on where I think that's advantageous and where I think it's a, a disadvantage. But before I get to that uh, point, I do want to spend a little bit of time uh, examining who's making the case for uh, why students should be greater consumers of their higher education and, and what their motivations are. When I've been trying to work out who's really driving the case for students uh, as consumers, uh, it's largely come, uh, as I see it, from two main areas. I think it's come from, as, you, uh, as has been said before, successive governments in terms of policy. And what's their rationale for that? I think that's because uh, successive governments have thought it uh, in the interests of them as a, 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 of a government to reduce the extent to which they fund uh, higher education. And it's been on that basis, a financial one, that they've deemed it important to try and uh, make the case as to why students as consumers should be at uh, uh, an advantage. The second group of uh, people or, or individuals that I think have largely driven the case for students as consumers are <coughs> university leaders themselves, largely. <coughs> Uh, 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 men, I think there are only 10 women vice chancellors. That's not necessarily uh, important, but I think it's interesting in terms of the way in which the uh, lobbying uh, of government to, uh, of, of university leaders to, uh, uh, to government has been uh, important. Um, I think that uh, many university leaders have sought to uh, uh, make the case for higher tuition fees, but rather narrowly forgotten uh, that as they make the case for higher tuition fees, that has allowed the government to step away from the extent to which they fund, fund uh, universities. I think also that uh, university vice chancellors uh, perhaps realise that they would rather, rather than perhaps be subject to government regulation and government control, they would actually quite like to be answerable to students because they know uh, that partly because students are such a, a transient uh, and moving population that they would never actually be uh, subject to greater uh, kind of scrutiny in that way. I should go on to say that actually the university leaders have in some ways ended up with the worst of both worlds, which is they have lost the government funding, which they perhaps rather narrowly or, narrowly or stupidly should have realised, but actually are subject to greater regulation, despite the fact that the direct funding of universe, uh, from government to universities has actually uh, uh, gone back. Um, I should just quickly say on that point that my personal perspective uh, uh, in terms of the way in which there should perhaps be an individual contribution to uh, universities should come through the form of a, of a graduate tax. And I should say that whilst I'm often accused of being a, a Labour stooge, that's a, a, regular, uh, a regular tag associated to any uh, current or former uh, NUS president, I was saying it uh, long before uh, Ed Miliband uh, kind of jumped on, a, on that particular bandwagon. But, um, my case for a graduate tax is that I think it, I, I, I recognise that individuals do gain a benefit <coughs> from going to their higher education, but I don't believe that the, the, the extent to which a student should fund their higher education should be linked to what and where they studied. I think it should be linked to how much they end up earning afterwards. Not directly related to the fact that they went to university, but I think that it's difficult to make the case for universities to be entirely funded out of general taxation when 50% of the population, indeed more than that, don't go to higher education. I think it's the best medium between uh, what is essentially a progressive form of general taxation but those that do benefit um, and earn more should pay more. Uh, and actually, I think there's quite a flawed market in the university system that we've got. I don't for a minute think that what the government are trying to promote in terms of a market in undergraduate tuition fees, where they hoped the top universities, as they saw it, would charge a greater amount, bears any correlation whatsoever, or limited correlation, with the quality that an undergraduate receives. I think it's a deeply flawed market that the sticker price that a university has been allowed to charge doesn't relate to the quality of the undergraduate experience, it doesn't really relate to the extent to which a student can get a transformational experience. It relates primarily to lead table standing, which is largely about research performance and not the quality of undergraduate teaching, and relates to history and prestige that an institution have, has. And actually, the government, in their quest to try and get universities to charge different amounts, in the belief that it will lead to an improved system, I think is a deeply uh, flawed one. 
But let me get to my kind of final points then about uh, um, perhaps some, if that wasn't controversial, some of my more controversial views on the fact that I think students do unquestionably have consumer traits and they're not necessarily all uh, bad uh, things. I think students, when it particularly comes to the service side of the university, um, they, are, they do consider themselves as paying for something and experience, and therefore it's quite right that they expect high quality services in, in, in response to that. I do think it's right that university accommodation services and student services uh, and uh, the students' union uh, and the gym and the sports services actually should provide a high quality, professional, personalised service to students that are paying a large amount uh, of money for, for that. I don't think it's acceptable for universities to reject the idea of consumerism um, uh, through allowing them to keep doing as they've always done. Um, uh, because students, uh, understandably, and I think quite rightly, are demanding of certain uh, services. So I think that many universities perhaps need to shake off the complacency in the way in which they've always done things, and they do need to um, improve and professionalise and personalise the sorts of services that they're providing students. Because students are saying, I'm paying X and therefore I expect Y uh, in return. Uh, and I think that's an understandable reaction from students, particularly in relation to the service side of their experience. But even on the pedagogical side of uh, sort of the learning and teaching experience that uh, students have as well, I don't think that uh, uh, it's up to students to start demanding um, uh, the kind of curriculum that they should be experiencing or the, the, or the nature of what they're learning. But I think there are aspects, even on the learning and teaching side, where students are within their rights to say certain things that imply being a consumer. For instance, um, students do, uh, some research that I was looking at conducted by NUS uh, on the extent to which students are having to wait for feedback on assessed work. Uh, students were, 25% uh, of students were just under, were saying that they were having to wait five weeks or more for feedback on assessed work, so um, essays that are handed in and so on. And students were largely saying that's unacceptable, and I would agree with them. And if that means that they are therefore allowed to engineer some kind of maximum turnaround time, whether it's two or three or four weeks, in terms of feedback being presented on work, I think that's a per perfectly legitimate position for students to take. And if they're using the arguments or the lens of consumerism to achieve that, then that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because so long as feedback is being applied uh, appropriately to further their learning and seen as kind of part of a sort of formative process where it's hoping uh, and ho helping them to improve, then that's perfectly uh, uh, within the rights of students. And I hope that might improve the experience that many students are getting in, uh, in higher education. Equally, the obsession, which I think uh, is right to point out, uh, which uh, Joanna mentioned around uh, employability, in some, research, in some senses is deeply unhelpful to the higher education experience. But again, looking at some research about what motivation students had for entering higher education, just over two thirds of students entering full time undergraduate uh, study said that their main reason, their primary motivation for entering higher education was to gain uh, employment afterwards and to try and improve their career prospects. And I don't necessarily have a problem with students saying that, being, saying that that is their main, uh, their main reason for going into higher education, because as you said, they are eventually having to pay a lot of money and they should get something in return uh, for that. That's not to say that an exclusive focus on employability isn't to the detriment of their experience overall, because I think it absolutely is. But what we do need to somehow uh, bring into the induction of higher education particularly is that you can uh, see higher education as a way for career progression uh, and personal development, but you should also see higher education as an opportunity for personal transformation, uh, for learning something uh, new that you probably and hopefully otherwise wouldn't have had the chance to, to do. Uh, and I think the two can coexist without being to the complete detriment uh, of uh, higher education. <coughs> My final point, very briefly, is to say that we should learn some quick lessons from the United States, because what we saw in terms of the market, and it's a different kind of market in the United States, but it does bear some similarities to the United States, uh, to, to the UK's direction of travel, is that most of the additional money was actually invested in the estate, in buildings, and part of the extracurricular uh, experience that students had. It didn't really particularly lead to improved staff-student ratios, better terms and conditions for staff, and ultimately, I think, a more robust educational experience for students. If that is the consequence of market reforms in UK higher education, that is deeply damaging uh, and deeply uh, unhelpful to, to students. And so we should uh, uh, look at the way in which UK higher education is moving and make sure we do, at the very least, learn the lessons of the United States. But I'm not confident that either university leaderships University leadership is up for that, or wanting to do that, and governments uh, of, of all three major parties are not particularly inclined to do that either. Thanks very much. Thank you, Aaron. In this complex debate, there's
there's one set of information um, about higher education that we tend to regard as objective. The National Student Survey, otherwise known as the NSS. I'm going to use the time that I've got to talk about the NSS um, because it's the way that we require students to express their voice and it's a very important part of the information that we give prospective students in order to enable them to choose which university course um, they should do. I'm going to um, argue that it's no good at doing either of those things and indeed by focusing on the National Student Survey, by giving it quite as much power as we do, um, we actually lose sight of what's really important in the public role of universities. And I'm not using that in the way that, that Joe used it as, as being a kind of narrow economic public good, but rather um, in, in the sense of universities being um, social and political institutions that have the power to sustain or promote social inequality sustain, sorry, or challenge um, social inequality. Now there's nothing wrong with collecting student feedback in a systematic way that allows us to compare across the sector. Uh, that's very much to be applauded. But the language that we use to do this, the terms of reference that we use, the questions that we ask, will shape our beliefs and values about higher education. <coughs> they tell students what higher education is, and they shape the relationships that they then have with academics and with their institutions. So one student I spoke to who just completed the NSS said, it gave me an idea of what I should be getting. So not only did that student get a checklist of what they should be getting, but also came to understand that should be getting was <coughs> intrinsic to, to what higher education was about. So we form the idea of consumer in the very way that, that we treat and interact with students. In the questions that the NSS asks, it strips all that is meaningful in higher and education. And it's acquired so much power in the minds of senior managers and, and leaders um, in, in universities that they siphon off scarce institutional resources in the futile aim of raising NSS scores year on year. And the NSS has power because it's become a measure personally and professionally of both academics and managers and institutions. A good friend of mine um, moving from one institution to another was told repeatedly by lots of people that, that she had to have a narrative about her inter interaction with her institution, previous institutions, NSS schools. Um, and university leaders have no incentive to challenge the NSS. Institutions that perform well have no reason to question it. Institutions that perform less well are constructed as having suspect reasons for doing so. So we're stuck with this particular way of seeking feedback from students. And it's also worth noting that the NSS is used in ways that are completely independent of any understanding of the statistical validity of its results. So for example, very regularly in the press, you have league tables of the raw results uh, from, from institutions comparing them, ranking them to each other. Hefke's own review of the NSS has told us that this is not a valid way to, to use NSS schools. Within institutions, subjects are compared to each other, and we know too that that is an invalid way to, to use the NSS results. And this is because um, we know that the results are influenced by, sub by the subject offer, so, for example, um, statistics and engineering courses are, are always bound to score less well than, than some, say, humanities subjects. Um, and student profile also influences those results. So the NSS, just to be a bit more specific, asks individuals to rate their three-year degree courses. So you give ratings across the whole three-year or four-year course. And, you, uh, and a student is asked to comment on teaching, assessment, academic support, organisation and management, personal development, and overall satisfaction. Comprehensive, isn't it? What you may ask is wrong with that. The answer is that, well, the answer is hidden in plain view. What it does is that it asks individual students about particular courses. And what that does is close down students' opportunities to comment on much larger issues. 
They, for example, cannot question institutional issues. Universities are social and political actors. They choose to run themselves as businesses rather than places of knowledge and education. And if a student has a problem with that, the, the only place that, where they can comment on that in the NSS is right at the end in, a, in an open comment. <coughs> Um, a student, um, just to give you an example, a couple of years ago wrote, I think the university as a whole has been strict of its character. Many decisions are taken without students. It's difficult to see where the money's going and it should be spent on students not marketing the university as a corporate enterprise rather than as a place of education as I believe the university should be. Quite a complex idea of what it means to be a consumer there in, in that student's comment. I'm going to just briefly list four other issues that are occluded by this way of asking students for their feedback, the National Student Survey. The second is an issue close to Michael's heart, I think. I think it's really quite shocking that nowhere in our student feedback mechanisms do we ask students what they make of the curriculum, of what they learn. And I recently did a, bit, a piece of research talking to students who had just been to open days and they were shocked that academics were not talking to them about what the content of their curriculum, what they were going to learn, but rather talked about employability issues and where their course would lead to, their links with industry. Um, and, they, and they found that particularly frustrating. Thirdly, and I think perhaps most importantly, that the NSS doesn't conceive of students as people who engage who are active agents in making their own experience. Fourthly, I think we pretend, in, when we look at the NSS scores, that experience happens in a vacuum, that students' chances of everything are unconstrained by class, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual orientation, or having responsibility for dependence. And finally, I think the NSS uh, includes the fact that universities and colleges are vastly different. I was re recently attending a seminar at the LSE and I, I felt like I'd entered the Savoy of, of, of higher education. And that, that's in sharp, sharp <coughs> contrast to, to the conditions and the, the architecture, the time, <coughs> the space environment that you see in many other universities around the country. And we lose sight of the fact that there are vastly different financial resources, not just in terms of fees, but in terms of history and therefore endowments that universities have to draw on. So that means that, that, that institutions differ vastly in the quality of academic engagement, levels of support, and in the way that they treat and ex have expectations of, of students. So what are the alternatives? Well, one alternative, if we look across to the United States, is something called the National Survey of Student Engagement. It asks questions such as, how often in the last six months have you asked questions in class or contributed to class discussions? And how often have you had serious conversations with students who are different from you in terms of their religious beliefs, political opinions or personal values? But even engagement as a concept has its critics. It makes assumptions about particular behaviours that, 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 that necessarily equate to learning. It assumes, for example, that if you don't speak in class that, that you're not engaging, that you're not learning, and that's not necessarily true. So whatever, what I'm trying to demonstrate is that whatever questions we ask students, we are building in assumptions. So I think it's important not only to have multiple frames of reference, in the way that we seek feedback from students, but also that we should ask different people. We should ask academics and universities about higher education in a more rigorous way than we currently do. And the question that I would ask, and I'll end on this point, the question that I would ask um, universities and academics is not how good are you at satisfying your students, but how good are you at helping all students, regardless of gender, race, social background, to fulfil their potential. And I'll give you uh, an interesting statistic to ponder. National data from 2010-11 shows that 68% of white students achieve a first or two one, compared to 49% of black and minority ethnic student groups. That's a gap of 19%, and a similar gap exists between home 
and international students. And there's still a gap in attainment after, uh, on race after we control um, for uh, social background. This means that universities are in effect widening inequality in our society. So even after we take into account the widening of the inequality in our school system, universities are actually making it worse. That is the public role that I would want universities to address. And distracting them and us with how satisfied students are and how good their accommodation is and whether or not they've got ensuite bedrooms is, uh, is, is an exercise in, in burying our heads in the sand. Thank you very much. range of, of points and views being expressed there and I think quite a lot to take up on. Um, so I'm going to ask you who would like to contribute. I see a show of hands. What I'd like to do is take probably about five points at a time and then we'll bring them on back and then I will come out to you again at least one more round. Okay, um, perhaps if I start at the back coming forward and then we'll come over to the side afterwards. Okay. Um, thanks, Shirley. Uh, one, one thing that I came across, or one person who seemed to tackle this issue quite well, was uh, Ben Coetzee at uh, Birkbeck, and he used the classic formulation of justified true belief in this contest and as an explanation as to why uh, education can't be commodified, because students, if, although it might appear to enhance the agency of students, actually to, to, to know something, requires agency on behalf of the student themselves if they can have a justified true belief and so it can't be and that's structural to the nature of knowledge itself. Um, I think Joanne's raised a really interesting point and it, it's, it's a really difficult <coughs> one, I think, which is um, one of the difficulties with the formulation of knowledge for its own sake or education as an end in itself uh, is that it does tend to have a circular character which is unlikely to be persuasive to those who are not already persuaded. Um, and it's a very difficult and delicate thing to do. And maybe one of the things is to look at well, what is that end? You know, not, not to reduce it or to instrumentalize it, to elaborate what that end might be. What is the end? Um, uh, or maybe another way of looking at it is under which historical conditions or social conditions is knowledge uh, honored as an end in itself? Because uh, I struggle to find examples outside of religion. Okay, thank you. Yes, the person right at the back then. Thank you. Well, uh, <clears throat> what I want to say follows on very much from the last point. I, I kind of wanted to agree with Joanne, but I, I find myself, um, in fact, sort of trying to challenge what she's saying to hopefully uh, she'll come by with a better answer. Um, Universities, especially in arts and humanities subjects, which no longer have block grant funding, are effectively selling a brand in the marketplace. Um, one could interpret what you said as, as a bias on that funding. They should say, um, we're not offering you an economic uh, good here. We're offering you to, we're offering to improve your cultural capital. We'll offer you some personal transformation and enrichment that will make you a, a more fulfilled person. In other words, they're offering a luxury good, perhaps um, a little bit like liberal arts colleges do in the States, which tend to be A, expensive, B, very good, uh, very good reputation in their teaching quality, and C, do very little in the way of um, research and knowledge generation. Okay, thank you. Somebody, um, can we just come down now to the person on the other? Yeah, person behind you, and I'll come to you on. Hi, hello there. Uh, I'm actually on my third degree of veterinary medicine, and I've done two degrees before, two science degrees, uh, a master's and a bachelor's, and uh, I just find this spectacular, because I, I don't feel like a consumer. I feel like I'm a bit of a criminal, and that I'm being fined for, because I, I did those degrees not to get a job, because I love knowledge, and I feel like uh, that has been sort of devalued. I, I feel like, uh, just the whole process of you know, putting a value on knowledge is dehumanising. And I think that is extraordinarily dangerous. Because I feel like students are dehumanised, they are products in a factory. 
they are not living, breathing souls who are there to be enlightened. And I feel I find that spectacular. And I think that the most scary thing about it is it makes people of my generation unsympathetic. And I feel like, uh, especially considering that the generation that have decided on tuition fees, and I have paid tuition fees, put up on paid tuition fees for eight years of my life, I think, considering that generation never had to pay tuition fees, in fact had grants to do become edu educated, I feel like it would make my generation unsympathetic. And I think that's very scary when you think about it. Okay, thank you. And the person just in front, and then we'll come back, and I'll come out again quite soon. Um, I, ha I have a suspicion where this whole debate comes from. And basically, um, if we look at we today, we essentially de um, defer judgment about the quality of education to the market because we ourselves have decommissioned values by which we can measure the quality of education. We say, oh, we don't know the, how a good education looks like, but the market will decide. So in other words, it's an unwillingness or incapability to take responsibility and say, these are our values. Now the question is, why should we have educational values? Well, it's not immediately transformed into value. It's a, in monetary value. It takes time. It can take 50 years if you have scientific breakthroughs the typical time for them to be realized is 50 to 70 years. Say, general relativity is completely useless, but today everybody uses them in their GPS. So this time needs to be bri uh, bridged over by having a value that says knowledge per se is a value. Okay, thank you. I mean, I've got some various points there about um, knowledge as an end itself, and actually what you are allowed to value uh, as a student these days. You know, are, are you allowed to really? value knowledge for its own sake. And, and where does it come from, I think, is a really big question. So, who'd like to start? Michael, would you like to talk about this? Yeah, okay. I, I've got sympathy for the guy who said he felt like a debtor, uh, that he takes two <coughs> degrees, because I realized that, in a sense, um, starting off uh, doing natural science to be in training to sociology, I would just wouldn't have been able to do that now, except for an exorbitant price. And in a sense, that would be feel, that feels like denying me as a learner who wants that to actually change. So I think it's really important that we've actually we locked education into a kind of commodity, even though at another level it can't it, it actually can't be. Um, the uh, the other per, the other thing I wanted to pick up was some one the issue that Toby raised at the back about knowledge for its own sake. Uh, where did it come from? It's often seemed to be it's often seemed to be a very elitist kind of argument that, in a sense, only people who didn't need to borrow, worry about their economic future could actually keep knowledge for its own sake. Uh, and I think we have to kind of really open that question up. Uh, we have to actually think that what knowledge for its own sake. Another meaning of it is that somebody gets sufficiently involved and committed to pursuing an inquiry in an area that they want to go on and do it. They don't ask the external reasons, it's the internal reasons, whether they're in fact studying English literature, or whether they're studying physics, or whether they're studying engineering, it doesn't really matter. But in fact, we've actually, only a very few people think that that is actually the fundamental thing. And what worries me about, in a sense, the whole debate is that in fact, it's kind of used economic categories, because consumption is economic category, not educational category. It's, it's using economic categories to discuss something, uh, so, something that's not primarily economic, but in fact, and we find that acceptable, and then we discuss it. And I think that we actually have got to force the argument back into it, actually thinking about it. It would be just the same if we were having to talk about health. Uh, everybody will talk about the funding of health, but actually we need to actually talk about what we mean by well-being and health when we're taking that discussion again. Okay, thank you, Michael. I'll I'd like to bring Aaron in next, please. Yeah, I, I also want to pick up on the on the comments uh, about uh, how perhaps people of our, our generation, if I, if I if I come correct in that assertion, may may be uh, sort of compelled to feel uh, because of the introduction of uh, of tuition fees and how that might might uh, uh, change our interaction with uh, our, our education. Um, I, I want to go back a step and just say that. Uh, if we, if we were trying to understand why 
uh, government have tried to take a, a, a step back. It's because, and it links into the question about the extent to which I think higher education has failed to articulate its broader benefits. As, higher, as the higher education community, and indeed education perhaps even more generally, has failed to make the case as to why it's important sometimes to not just realise a benefit three or five years down the line, but actually to say sometimes it's important uh, that uh, the benefit of higher education may not be realised for, for 50 years. But I don't hear that, uh, I don't hear that case made uh, from any kind of, in any political sphere or indeed in any policy making sphere in relation to higher education specifically. And that, in the absence of that, uh, the absence of that viewpoint or the absence of that component of the debate I think has allowed governments <coughs> to take the direction of travel they have such that it does force many young people uh, to make quite a sort of um, uh, uh, utilitarian almost sort of uh, view uh, uh, and decision about what and where to study and that's perhaps most uh, uh, drastically uh, exhibited through uh, actually Bill Rammel when he was uh, Labour's higher education minister in about 2008, which introduced uh, something called the uh, removal of funding for equivalent and lower uh, qualifications. So if you already had a degree, uh, then you were not going to get any state funding for uh, a degree of that level. What essentially that meant is, if you already, if you already decided to study uh, a physics degree and you felt at some point in your life you wanted to retrain and, and perhaps study uh, a philosophy or vice versa, you were going to get absolutely no state funding to do that whatsoever. And I think that gave off, and it only saved actually £100 million, which in the context of things uh, really wasn't a dramatic part of the total university higher education budget. But I think that completely summarised the way in which government felt you have to make a decision pretty much at 18 about what direction travel that you want to take. And once you've taken that, uh, once you've made that decision, you're kind of uh, almost on a production line. And whilst I won't perhaps use as dramatic a language as you chose to do, I think many students do feel um, uh, be beginnings of desensitisation to uh, the the broader higher education experience that, they, that they've got, and I do worry about what that will lead uh, to in the future. My final quick point is, um, I, I've known lots of undergraduate students that have graduated in recent years, and many of them who are actually uh, in studying a subject and really enjoying it, have said that they would like to pursue further study, perhaps at a, a postgraduate tour or even research level, have said that they, can't, they feel that they can't afford to stay in academia because they want to start repaying their, their student loan. There is a massive equity issue about where our next generation, particularly of postgraduate students, are going to come from. There's already uh, quite a significant skew towards those from more affluent backgrounds, and I think that the funding regime and the general discourse about higher education means that people will look at the, the return on investment for postgraduate study and it will be completely uh, non-existent, and I worry about who will lead uh, our teaching and ultimately our universities in years to come because it really only will allow them to become drawn from a particular background. Um, a, review, uh, a report just out this week by Alan Milburn, who is the government's independent reviewer on social mobility and child poverty, and it's a report that looks at um, higher education. Um, it does make the case uh, that um, universities um, that the universities have a, a social and public role that goes beyond economic good. But what I found particularly interesting is how little press coverage it got. I, I don't think it's entered anywhere into the public discourse. Um, and the second point I wanted to make was just to, to do with um, whether students themselves regard themselves as consumers. Um, I think the only time that the government has actually tried to find out what information students would like in order to make choices about higher education. They put together a matrix of kinds of information that they could have um, that came from university managers and then set up focus groups with students in which they showed them the matrix and said, what information would you like out of this? And the students said, well, that looks relevant, that looks relevant, and that looks relevant. Um, and then the researchers said, well, what, uh, where have you made any efforts to find this information? And the students were over the whole said, well, no, I haven't, because I've only just seen this kind of information presented. And then the government's public information strategy was formed and continues to be formed on the basis of that research. Um, so what I think that no students I've spoken to, and I do spend quite a lot of my life talking to students, 
um, want to be what see themselves as consumers. I think the, the point at which consumer discourse kicks in is when they feel that there is no there are no other grounds for complaint. You know, when when the forums for public debate are closed down um, and, and when they don't feel they're getting a redress, then they start talking about where or where are my fees going to them. Okay, thank you. I think we continue to pick up on that, but Joe. Thank you. I think um, when we argue for, when I argue for knowledge for its own sake, uh, people always throw back at me, oh, uh, you believe in a golden age of higher education, and um, I'm, I'm kind of confronted with this myth of a golden age that I am apparently arguing for. Uh, and I often dispute that, and I don't think there is or has been a golden age, perhaps a golden age is yet to come. Sector, uh, in higher education, um, but I think in I think the reason why I don't think there's been a golden age is perhaps because people, individual students, have always gone into the university with their own private motivations, uh, desire to escape impoverished circumstances, a particular job or career, confirm their social status. We look back through history; individuals have always had their private motivations. However. Because the university as an institution, the university as a whole, served a broader educational purpose, then those private purposes were never allowed to subsume the overall educational role of the university. What's happened nowadays, because the educational, the overall educational role in terms of um, passing on a body of knowledge of society's collective wisdom from one generation to the next, because that has We've lost faith, basically, in our ability to do this. We've lost faith in what body of knowledge should we pass on and how should we pass on this body of knowledge. Because that's gone, all we have left is the collective totality of individual <coughs> private purposes. And I think that's how we end up with students thinking and behaving as consumers. I think when we try and put other purposes on higher education, such as more social purposes, um, expecting universities to play a social and a public role in solving problems which, you know, I would be the first to acknowledge do exist in society. There is social disadvantage, there is social inequality in society. But the more we expect universities to play a role in, serving, in solving those problems, the more we shift the role of the university away from an educational institution. And essentially, we run the risk of making it a political football so whichever social problem becomes the problem of the moment, then governments can say, you know, this is the current social obsession, this is our current preoccupation, solve it. It's your job to solve it. And I think it's really important that universities do, although I, you know, I agree it's perhaps a difficult task, but it's really important that we do um, defend knowledge for its own sake so we don't risk, run the risk of becoming a political football. Okay, thank you. We've got um, quite a lot more hands, and there are lots of students in the audience, I know, so you can tell us, you can confirm or, or deny what I was saying, whether you see yourselves as consumers. And perhaps also think about what you see as meaning by agency and your responsibilities and roles as students, actually. Let's come to the person who was there had a hand up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to the panel. I found something you said really um, I would like to make a couple of points. Um, Joanna, in your first speech, you used the phrase, you mentioned that you didn't see tuition fees as a financial transaction because you didn't own a hand over £10 pound note when you went to lectures. I think I have to disagree with you there. That's the same way of saying a mortgage isn't a financial transaction because you, we, we will still be paying for it and we are paying a large amount for it, so I really do see it as a financial transaction. Um, I don't think we should pay for higher education in the same way that we don't pay for primary education and we don't pay for secondary education. But I am realistic and I agree with Aaron. We do have to put you know, some of our own money towards it and a graduate tax does seem reasonable. However, what I don't see as reasonable is that the graduate tax is paid back related to our income. Because I think what that does is make an innate assumption that the university education and what we get out of it and what that education helps is to get a good job. And I think that is a problem. And if we do go on to, earn, uh, to have higher earnings throughout the university education, which statistics show that we do, you know, people with higher incomes are going to pay more anyway because income tax goes up with incomes. So I think that's a good point to make. And secondly, open day, you know, I've had the same experience on open days. You walk around and you get shown things. You know, this is the accommodation block. 
this is, you know, how you spend your time. But again, there wasn't really any coverage of the curriculum. And also something that I thought was very interesting was when I went to the desk and got my name tag and everything, someone said, I'll oh, make sure you, you're, you're on time to the employability talk, because that's the most popular one. <laughs> and I was just completely shocked, because I think that shows that universities are reciprocating what government is doing by time, the nature of education, to employability, and to getting a good job. And I think that's wrong, because I think education is important for the state. Okay, let's see what a few other people have got to say. Um, there's a hand up. Hang on, perhaps I should come to forward. I think you had your hand up very early on, didn't you? So let's take you first. Thank you. I actually had, had three degrees. One was a teenage, you're at uh, your university, and then two at age one as a as a master and a computer student. I think uh, it was changed over the, over, over time because we're obviously the fact that there's a client in the client in mind. In fact, I got I got paid for the first degree and had to pay for the for the second. But I've always considered myself as a consumer, I'll tell you why. When you actually um, apply, you think, what is the curriculum? Now, okay, I mean, you carve the uh, from the um, car 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 to the whole group for me. So you say, is this relevant to me? Will I find it interesting? And I'm interested, is this is important, but it's both important. So yes, I've always considered myself as a, as a consumer. Also, when I, when I was a student, I was on the student consulting body, effectively you were always saying that, you know, is this providing what I want? Let's say for students, if you don't get what you want, complain. It's the same sort of thing. It's, uh, well, actually, most of the really were pretty good, actually, but I say, could you uh, look at this? This isn't quite right, and uh, can you change that? Uh, one question, I made an interesting point out about um, universities getting less funding. They're still getting, they're still getting more board of regulation. Now, there is one private university in, in the country, which is Buckingham. I'm not in favour of um, private universities for myself, I might need to have links with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the local area. But do you actually see that might be the way that universities are going? They say, if you want to give us money, that's fine, you can tell us what to do. But if you're not giving us much money, why are you going to try and, what, 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 why should you regulate it? Just will become private institutions, if necessarily not populating private institutions, and we'll decide what we want to do. So we're going to see the free, free university, like the schools. Um, okay, um, let's go to the back now. There's some of the yellow t shirt there. And now I'll come across back to this side. We'll see if I can more people on this side. So, yeah. Uh, first, I'm going to talk to Mr. Porter on his uh, use of the word student's experience. What does this phrase even mean? That is the complete commercialization of education, especially higher education. What we should be talking about when you say, you know, what a student is doing at university, it should be the student, you know, scholarism or the academic students or, you know, university scholarism or something like that. That, that is, the student's experience is just sort of the rubbish. <laughs> Use a, a, bit, uh, a bit more of an adult word for some children. <laughs> <laughs> um, and secondly, your point about accommodation services and all, and, you know, the careers service. You know, I've just started third year, and uh, we had these introdu introduction talks in the first week about the employability service. Christ, I mean, <laughs> what is that about? Well, we don't expect you to actually do any academic work, but you bet we've been out a good job six months later, so that'll be look a lot better when we, when we can do the open days, uh, you know, next year. What a little bit crap. <laughs> um, secondly, I want to attack Dr. Sabri on the uh, use of this. Um, you were saying about the, NS the NSS isn't, isn't you know, good, and then, then you went on to talk about uh, racial and ethnic profile and the differences between um, marks. Actually, by the time you're 18, the person who's responsible for their marks is that person. I'm responsible for the marks I'm getting at university, not the lecturer. Regardless of my class, uh, race, or anything else. I'm 21 years of age now. I am responsible for the marks I am receiving, not the lecturer. Okay, thank you. Um, right, the, the woman in the glass is at the back, and then I'll come forward. Which one? Which one? Oh, sorry. I've got up there. Stop it, I've got that. You're confusing us. Um, I just wanted to go back to the point that you said behind me about. Um, it's sort of the question of whether education should be seen not so much as an, a luxury, but should we really explore whether we should see it as an entitlement? Um, I, was, I, I, I don't really know about this, but I was, I was just thinking about, um, say, you think about the acting profession. 
Now, in order to become a successful actor, you have to work really, really hard and be really, really diligent, and it's a very, um, and you have to show a certain amount of talent and that kind of thing, or, or, or any of the performing pressures. It's very, very difficult to get into and be successful at. And I think one of the problems with things about university, we've, we've almost forgotten that universities are academic institutions. Actually, they are, um, they are about a, a particular area of social activity, which is an area of study and development of knowledge. And whether or not you call that knowledge knowledge is safe, which I think is a sort of, you know, it, it's, it's a sort of an abstraction in a way. But whether, whatever you're doing your research for, it is research, it is study, it's a particular form of social activity and intellectual activity. And not everybody's very good at it, and not everybody enjoys doing it. And if we just thought a little bit more about um, it, it just being an area where, where you had to compete to get into and you had to really want to do it and you also had to be a bit good at it and you could progress in it, you know, or not as you ultimately chose. Some people go to acting school and they get, you know, progress on into being actors because they can't quite take the pressure. If we thought about it a little bit more like, like that, perhaps we would then get back to the question of what universities are for, which is for the development and study of knowledge. Um, and then we have to have, obviously have, have, have to other, have other institutions in society that help people become other things they might want to become. But I just think it's, it's this question of entitlement. I really think we need to interrogate what does that really mean, and what is entitlement for? Okay, thank you. I'm going to take one more, and then I'm going to come back. But I will come out again because there's enough time to do that. Um, the woman there, yes, just in front. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Um, just a proposal on without your thinking in terms of both. Maybe it's time to decouple knowledge from qualifications. I'm just thinking of uh, many countries, like my own original country, Lebanon, where a university education is actually about getting a qualification. And it's always been something you paid for. And uh, maybe the debate is about, you know, I, I mean, I'm all for knowledge from all respect, absolutely. But maybe there are other ways of getting knowledge and uh, experiencing what Michael uh, and, you know, could, mentioned about uh, being a scholar and uh, research and research they can study and something. And actually seeing universities as a place where you pay for a qualification and uh, maybe we can have a free market in that. Just, just an idea. Okay, thank you. Right, I'm going to come back to um, some brief comments on whatever you want to. Aaron, I'll come to you first because you came out with a couple of people in the audience. Uh, please, uh, a uh, couple of comments. Uh, let me uh, let me just uh, approach the sort of question of the of the graduate tax. I think that uh, that, that was made. Um, I, I I think the um, the contribution an individual makes has to be linked to their earnings and not kind of where they where they studied. Because I think it would be unhelpful uh, that the amount that I, I think it would be wrong for someone uh, who goes to uh, Similar university, they go to a sort of. They might argue they've gone to similar universities, and someone ends up earning kind of twenty thousand pounds, and someone ends up earning fifty thousand uh, pounds. Um, I think it's right that the person that earns fifty thousand pounds pays both more in general taxation, but also pays more in a, in a graduate tax to help kind of fund our, our higher education system. Um, because I worry that if the amount that, that some people would argue uh, that the amount you pay is linked back to your institution or what you've studied, I, I think in some ways that makes it more of a decision about kind of how much you earn and therefore kind of the amount you um, the amount you pay should be linked to what and where you can study. But it's uh, it's it's um, can, can it just be a base rate? Like it's not like no no no. Sorry. Yeah. Just... Yeah. You, perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, and there are a million ways in which you can construct a graduate tax. Truth. Quickly on the point of, uh, of private institutions, what is clear is government are actively encouraging uh, um, private institutions to, to grow and, uh, and increase. Um, uh, and in some respects, um, uh, I think that uh, private institutions, if they are trying to offer a kind of uh, provision which is uh, uh, shakes up what institutions are doing. I don't necessarily have a, a problem with that. I, I would worry uh, if uh, private universities are set up in a way in which their sort of main motive is profit, and therefore I would uh, find that difficult to reconcile. They're offering something that would kind of um, add something to the education landscape, um, whilst also adhering to a profit motive. But if you could potentially reconcile the two, 
uh, then I'm not, then I'm not, uh, then I'm not of the opinion it's necessarily uh, a, a bad thing. But I, I, I'd have to be, resolved. I'd have to kind of get some resolution on that point. And the final point I want to make is that um, a couple of the comments and questions have kind of really had a go at. Uh, the provision of, of, of employability, and that being a, a, a bad thing. I have to say, I've met lots and lots of students for whom the main reason they've gone into higher education, we can take a view on this whether we, whether we want to, but they believe it can take them away, it, it can transform uh, the kind of lifestyle they've had up until that point. It can take them from, and this, you know, it is easy for people to say, I was brought up on a, a council estate uh, in a deprived part of the, of the country, and actually a higher education degree, uh, and therefore getting a job afterwards has transformed my life, transformed my family's life. I think that's actually a good thing, and if universities can give the right kind of support to uh, help students articulate the broader benefits they picked up from their higher education experience, we should uh, be we should be encouraging that because if we don't have things like career services and employability support, the likelihood is it's those students, and I say this rather controversially, from middle class backgrounds who have had the cultural capital all their life to be able to articulate the benefits and, and uh, you know have to be in the old boys network and get the sorts of jobs. If we don't have the right kinds of career services and employability, my theory is that we'll only ever allow the same old advantage people to get the right kinds of jobs. Actually, we should be opening that up to as many people as possible, and it might for us actually give the, it might actually allow our universities to genuinely deliver some social mobility rather than just attacking employability for its own sake. Sorry, I was going to be uh, back to that because I think there's, there's something that I know you'd want to respond to straight away. Okay, go ahead. Firstly, just on the employability thing then, um, that Aaron's just raised, I think uh, we need to be a whole heap more honest with ourselves about the employability issue. Ultimately, the people who get the best jobs in society are not the people who have been taught how to write CVs, who've spent three years honing communication skills, uh, learning how to give presentations and engaging in teamwork exercises. The people who get the top jobs in society are the people who've been to uh, the highest ranking universities who have spent three years immersed in subject knowledge, engaging with a body of subject knowledge. And if we think we can buy people a place in the middle class through teaching them how to write a CV and um, how to give a presentation and how to write a report, then we're not being honest with ourselves. Uh, just to come back very, very briefly on two other things then. Firstly, the comment from the lady at the back about uh, qualification versus education. In 2009, um, Peter Mandelson made the point that a university degree was a, a ticket, and that's the actual word that he used, a ticket to social mobility. And I think the degree qualification can very much be seen as a ticket nowadays, that you go to university for three years, you pick up your ticket at the end of it, and you can walk down to a job. This is the assumption that you can then walk down to a job and trade this ticket in for your £100,000. Uh, I think there's a great deal of, of confusion there. I think, you're, I think you're right, but I think all the focus is on the qualification, and very little focus is on the education side of it. Uh, the only other point I wanted to make was to uh, come back on what the uh, guy at the back was saying about individual responsibility. I think that's ever such an important point, and I think it really goes to the heart of a lot of this debate about what's going on in universities nowadays and the status of students. Um, the, one of the assumptions alongside the idea that education is a commodity is that it's a commodity that can be measured in terms of contact hours, uh, with the more contact hours necessarily being better. Well, you know, you only have to go back a generation or two where people would talk about reading for a degree. I mean, they still do it on University Challenge, but it sounds kind of quite, quite quaint when they do this on University Challenge nowadays. But the assumption behind reading for a degree was that you were independent, and if you weren't independent, then you were striving towards becoming an independent student. And, and I think you're right, a lot of that assumption has gone out and we kind of infantilise students nowadays with lots of contact hours and we don't assume um, that anything really is their own individual responsibility. Thank you. Good. Um, just briefly on the, the financial transaction that, that students are <coughs> making, um, I think the, the, the current system proposed by um, Lord Brown does a really interesting kind of contradictory um, dance where it's both asking students to be distant from the loan that they're taking on, distant enough to not feel anxious about going into higher education, but at the same time it's asking them to be highly conscious of the value for money judgment that they're about to make. 
So they both they both need to be distant and close up to it. Um, I think that's kind of just very messy thinking that that's gone on there. Um, and you know, you, and, and uh, you know, there, there are there are multitudes of sociologists talking about how able students from different backgrounds are to to to, to negotiate that. Um, I think there's a, a kind of growing um, theme of disagreement amongst this um, about the tension between the social responsibility of universities and knowledge for its own sake. And I think the idea that um, you can pursue knowledge for its own sake in a way that doesn't um, articulate a particular political or, or social agenda is, is balmy. Of course, any curriculum that you choose articulates particular, uh, makes um, kind of identity choices. Uh, it, 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 it decides what's important. Uh, let, let's take a science example. A pharmacy student, PhD pharmacy student, coming to this country to choose um, a, 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 to, to, uh, their research question has a really difficult dilemma to negotiate. They can either go for a subject that um, is uh, high on the agenda of their research supervisor and relates to um, a, a, a society of the global north, or say they're a Malaysian student, um, or they can go for a, a subject that is relevant to their local community um, that won't actually give them a very good head start in, in their academic career in, in the global north. So we, um, we impose knowledge structures at every stage of our education system that reinforce inequalities in our society, both within the UK and internationally. And that relates to the point that was made at the back about um, assessment and the idea that your assessment result is going to be um, utterly uh, based on, on your own efforts as an individual student. I think that's absolute, that, that, that is a good point to make, that it is, that, 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 that your own efforts count for a lot. <coughs> I'm really sad to tell you this, but that's not all that matters. What also matters is who you are, the extent to which you are able to make successful relationships with the academics around you, and build up a rapport with them, and understand what this thing higher education is about and what your discipline is, is, is really about and what's valued in it and what constitutes a right answer. Okay, thank you. Michael? Yeah, three quick points. One, I think that the whole discussion about student fees and uh, students as consumers needs to be set in a, in a broader context. On the one hand, uh, because the, the pressures on universities at the moment, the way they're being driven, not is in fact primarily through searching, uh, developing consultancy contracts, bidding for funds for research, recruiting overseas students because they're worth much more. In the sense, uh, within that, they're becoming, in a sense, fiscally bound institutions in terms of their priorities. And in a sense, the student fee issue is just one part of that. It's not the the employability issue, I think, is also kids are taught to think instrumentally about education in the early parts of secondary schools now. They come with that notion that, in fact, they are learning to do something else. It's not, you know, it's not that they suddenly come to university and find, gosh, I've got to think about a degree for a job. They've been doing that, one. and it's actually a much more wider part of our of, of our society. And lastly, there's, I mean, any thought about expanding private higher education. I just think anybody should go to those parts of the world where in fact higher education is predominantly private for profit, like for instance Latin America. And in fact, you would come back and say, thank goodness we actually haven't got any, or we have any little. Thank you. Now, we're running out of time now, and I do, oh my goodness. <laughs> I do want to take these, because I have to be really quick um, questions, points, please. And, I, and, and also, when I come back to the panel, finally, it's going to be literally 30 seconds to really say you know, your country last comment that we all leave the room with. Um, there's a, a man right at the back there, yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks. I disagree with Joanna about um, a ticket. It's much more as that famous University of Hobbiton said, a receipt of the, the, uh, the university. 
But if you ask yourself a general question, why have a university at all? Why from the university? A university reflects society's commitment to the pursuit of truth and knowledge. That's what it does, and that's why you have it. What has happened, and if you read it in all the policy documents and all the things written by Charlie Ledbetter, is this complete disbelief in knowledge. And all that stuff about the learning age, all universities learn, replace the university with an iPad, that's all you get. So there is a real, real serious attack on knowledge that nobody has really challenged, particularly academics. But while that exists, and you don't think you need the university, you just lock onto the internet, and that's where your knowledge is, there's no excuse for university. Then it can become the home for anything. It can be a bus station to different destinations. It can do anything you like. And you have to sell it then, because you put it no longer has any value. You have to try and market it for a million different reasons. And one thing I would say, most of the students who've spoken here today give you faith that it's nothing to do with the students. And you can see just two examples of how universities can produce the most pathetic um, examples. Um, Harvard University, has um, uh, the, the law school, had a therapy dog for their students. Right? In case you're so stressed when you go to university, you can't go with it. And one of our top universities here has a sign called Overcoming Perfectionism. Right? When you go to this top university, you go to classes to make sure you don't want to know too much and change the world. So it's a real problem, and academics have completely failed to deal with this issue, the attack on knowledge, because they celebrate all this stuff about the internet. Okay, thank you. And there was someone over there, yes, a woman with glasses on the left hand side. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering why it hasn't been discussed the fact that um, international students have been, um, they're, they're kind of, they're right in terms of consumerism. Um, and it seems to be kind of double standard because um, for people in the UK, um, Yes, it's like, let's not go over them, let's not become that. But in the meantime, you have universities um, searching for obviously the students pay the, the fees that are going to then finance um, the services and whatever else here in the UK. So I'm just wondering why it hasn't been actually uh, taken into account in such a kind of good example. Of that. Okay, thank you. Um, let's come back here now to the woman on the left hand side here. Can make sure that your comments really are short, Sorry. sharp, and to the point, yeah. please. Yes. Um, I think it's a little bit unfair to think of university education as specific to formal education. It's my third degree right now, and I think most of what I've learned is actually to informal education through what we call student experience, so meeting people with various backgrounds, developing ideas and discussions, and so forth. So, focusing specifically on what academia fails to do is a little bit of unfair towards the entire purpose of education to give us a transformational experience at the end of those three or four years. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, woman over here now, and then I'll come to Brown. Um, hi, I'm applying to university I just had last month, and I don't think that um, knowledge at science has been lost. I mean, I'm paying £27,000 to go to uni for three years to study what I love not because I'm going to get 100k out of it. I mean, if you put on your application, I want to study this course because I'm going to get 100k at the end. If you're not going to get in, the people that get into the unis are the ones that love the subject and really want to study it and have a passion for it. So I don't think that's the loss of all. I mean, I've got up at 6.30 in the morning, two days in a row, on a weekend, to come here and listen to lectures, and I'm 17. I don't think that's necessarily lost, this love of knowledge at all. OK, thank you. Um, yes, here. Um, at the risk of, I don't want to start a generation war here, but just I'm a bit worried about the sort of anti-number thing going on. I think we need to just question ourselves a little about this. When I went, I'm quite old, I went to university in 1973, and there were about 250,000 students at University of the UK then. There are roughly, people on the panel know better than me, but there are roughly five to six times that number now. You've got to think about what that means. When I went to university, there was a grant system.